Uh, so, um, yeah, I also have a number of hats. Um, I'm a professor in human-computer interaction and psychology, but not spelling, apparently. Uh, <laughs> Um, I, I direct this Learn Lab, which is kind of the scientific arm of the Simon Initiative, and, and that's the URL where you can get to the summer school. Um, actually, another thing you can find there is my e-learning design course we're making available this summer, um, and that, that's a whole summer-long 20-unit course implemented in the Open Learning Initiative, uh, lots of formative assessments, and a, a, a student-directed project where you develop a an uh, e-learning unit. Um, I'm the director of this master's program, the Master's of Educational Technology and Applied Learning Sciences. We're producing learning engineers that are getting out in the field and, 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 and into academia. Actually, a number of them are here in the room. There's a cluster of three over there that work as part of the uh, uh, Everly Teaching Center. Um, uh, and uh, we have... Uh, uh, capstone projects with that group where uh, industry sponsors can get a team, an interdisciplinary team of five students to work on a project from January to August uh, of, of your choosing. Um, so I want to go forward, not backward, and uh, uh, I want to highlight some, some of our tools for doing learning analytics and illustrate how we can close the loop uh, by using insights from those analytics to make course improvements and then show that those course improvements make a difference in, for student learning. And I want to uh, make a contrast between applying learning science, which you, you, we've heard many people say they're doing for many years, and doing learning science. And, and I think what we've discovered over, over the years, and, and Michael echoed this yesterday, is you know, as much as I've been uh, a part of both consuming and producing learning science literature, when I've built applications, they often don't work. So we really need to uh, have an it iterative cycle, an engineering process, where we do the best to design based on science in the beginning, but we de develop, deliver, and see what happens and make discoveries about what is and isn't working and then go around this loop again. So uh, that has been hard to do, but we think we can make it easier. And I want to give an example of that. So we've got a lot of tools. If you go to the website, um, uh, you'll see the laundry list of tools. We should probably organize them by how they hit those uh, different uh, elements in the loop, by the way. Uh, I'm going to highlight uh, these in particular, so uh, both uh, analytic tools on the right and uh, design and development and delivery tools with OLI. And I'm going to do that in the context of what we've referred to as the doer effect. Uh, so LearnSphere um, is a, a part of a legacy of uh, uh, Jim this morning referred to National Science Foundation funding. Learn Lab was a 10-year science of learning center that NSF funded for nearly $50 million. And then there was follow-up funding from the cyber infrastructure group at NSF that helped build LearnSphere. And, Le and the goal of LearnSphere was is to, to bridge across different kinds of data from clickstream data to discourse data to MOOC level data, um, and allow you to do an analyses at different time scales. Detailed learning process data, learning outcome data, the connection between the two. And this particular involves the connection, this particular analysis uh, that I will talk through or involves connection, connecting learning process data with learning outcome data. And is, is this a pointer? Oh yeah, look at that. Um, the oh, this this is a pointer too. Uh, <laughs> these uh, these components, uh, the rectangles here, are are uh, analytic components that you can select from this menu, drag out, and then uh, connect together to do analyses. And amongst other kinds of analyses, the causal inference tools from Tetrad are available here. And so. I want to illustrate how you can use these to make discoveries. Um, and one of the questions you can ask with your course, if it's appropriately instrumented, is 
how does variation in students' choice to use different resources impact their learning outcomes? So we had this opportunity uh, to analyze some data from uh, a massive open online course delivered through Coursera at the highest level of developed by Georgia Tech, um, but then including a, a number of OLI uh, um, readings and formative assessment materials. And you see a little video of one of the drag and drop uh, um, activities down here. I'll expand that in a second. Uh, um, the integration of these two is important, but it's also important that both Coursera and OLI were built in a way that all the interaction data is stored. So we have an opportunity to tell which students did more of some of these things and uh, less of others, for example. So j just to expand, you already saw examples of, uh, from Norm, uh, you know, OLI has a certain structure to it. There are always explicit learning objectives that organize the content on reading pages. Um, these interactive activities have a, a feedback on student responses. Hints are available. Uh, there are, here's another drag and drop unit in this psychology course. There are also open-ended activities. Um, uh, the submit and compare is a nice one. So when the student types in an open-ended response and they submit it, they get to see uh, your answer, the instructor or expert answer to this question. So that's a way to, without having natural language understanding, to get some open-ended interaction and feedback. Um, open, uh, doing natural language processing, by the way, is part of the toolkit, if you're interested in that, as an aside. Uh, so the question, again, is what student choices associate with the most learning? Um, and I want to emphasize, uh, again, that the way these courses are delivered makes this analysis possible, right, because all the data is being stored. We put this data through Tetrad, um, and uh, Tetrad produced this causal model uh, you saw a little bit of yesterday. And uh, in particular, I want to highlight how this causal model is, in essence, controlling for pretest, um, which does have a direct effect on the quiz. But then you see these counts of activities, that's the doing, counts of reading, uh, particularly the readings that are, are not associated with activities, and the uh, amount of watching. And these are standardized regression coefficients, if I can be a little technical, which allows you to compare them directly. Sorry, this seems to be on uh, auto forward here. Uh, this means that if a student is doing a standard deviation more than another student, there'll be a 0.44 standard deviation improvement in the quiz score, according to the model. Um, if they're watching a standard deviation more, there's a 0.06 uh, um, increment on their total quiz score. And their total quiz score has a direct effect on their final exam. So what you see here, I hope, is that the association between the doing and the outcome is much larger than the watching and the reading, right? Learning by doing uh, appears to have a six times bigger association with the learning outcome than watching or reading. Uh, so that's the fundamental discovery we've made. Is that a causal link? You should consider alternative hypotheses and be happy to talk about some of our investigations into those. Um, but another thing that we often uh, aspire to but don't often do enough is to test hypotheses like this across multiple courses. Um, so this is just one course. Well, with uh, LearnSphere's tool, it's pretty easy to create a workflow and then import different data sets from, from different OLI courses in this case and do this analysis with each one. No programming needed. This is all drag and drop, and you can each one of these intermediate results can be viewed here. Uh, we did this for an information systems course, a biology course, a, a statistics course, and another non-MOOC uh, instance of this psychology course. And as you can see, this is a, a large number of, of students involved, over 12,000 students across these, uh, th these data sets. And uh, just to highlight the uh, doer effect here. So this is the ratio of the impact of doing compared to reading, um, which we saw before was about six times. So we see different uh, ratios here on the total 
quiz score, similar ratios on the final uh, uh, grade. Turns out the median uh, across all of these is, is exactly six again. Um, so uh, that was a, 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 an interesting coincidence. But this is now five different course instances and two different measures across all the courses. So um, uh, perhaps this comes off to you as a, a kind of duh, like we've known about learning by doing since Dewey and, uh, and, uh, and so forth, right? But I think it is important, especially given how much effort many people have put into the reading materials and those lecture videos, and I think sometimes not as much effort into the formative assessment activities, right? Uh, so um, here's another great quote from Herb Simon. He said, learning results from what the student does and thinks, and only from what the student does and thinks. The teacher can advance learning only by influencing what the student does to learn. So our goal is to influence that doing and thinking as best we can. And a passive watching of lecture or of reading doesn't necessarily do that. Of course, some students are very active in their reading and in their watching. They might stop and rewind, right? Um, and we'd, we'd certainly want to encourage more of that. But are there ways that we can make reading more active, make reading more like doing? So that's how we, we chose to try to close this loop here. And I hope you've been following along on the highlighted pieces here in our loop. So I want to say a little bit about design here. So one of the techniques we've employed, um, we borrowed from the literature. In the literature, it's called predict, observe, explain. We've added an extra explain step. And I want to show you how this works. So um, we take a reading, and this is from this psychology course. Actually, this is from a social psychology course, a different one at CMU. Um, an experiment is described in this reading. And the idea with predict and observe explain is instead of being told what happened, you actually get a chance to hear what the experiment setup was and make a prediction. That's the predict step. Um, and that's shown here. They're making a prediction. Then, before they observe, we ask them to explain, what's your intuition behind your prediction? If you were the psychologist, before you'd run this study, what would have been your hypothesis and why? What's your theory behind it? Then they observe what actually happened in that experiment. That's the observed phase. And, and then they explain why the actual result occurred with reference to the text that describes the psychologist's theory about it. So the same reading material is eventually available, but we start off right from the beginning with, with, with doing rather than reading. Um, so we uh, it, uh, did an experiment here. So this is closing the loop back to discover. We've gone all the way around from we discovered with a, early versions of courses and then designed, developed, and uh, uh, based on our insights. And now we're back to data analysis. Um, uh, one technique that I think is really great for doing these kinds of studies in real courses is a crossover design. So we, we had two units of the course, each ending with a test. And in one unit, uh, a random set of students got this PEOE treatment, and the other students did the reading. Uh, by the way, followed by practice. So they were still doing practice in the control condition, but it was after the reading. And then in the second unit, they cross over, right? And then the treatment becomes the control, and the control becomes the treatment. And then when we analyze the data, we're averaging across the these are actually the two different groups on the two different exams, the subgroups that, that got the treatment compared to the, the subgroups uh, who didn't. Um, this turns out to be a, a half a grade improvement, a, a statistically reliable effect that we've demonstrated from this in, in, a, in a course here, here at CMU. Uh, closing the loop. Um, so I hope this concretely illustrates what you can do here. Um, it occurs to me that one thing I wanted to emphasize that I forgot on this point is that uh, the echo authoring tool that Norm uh, demonstrated is just the kind of tool you can use to make this transformation. You can make these predict, observe, explain activities um, through it, well, which we actually did. Um, uh, and then 
The delivery um, is, uh, is made possible through the tools. But it's not just that it gets to students. Again, it gets to students in a way that the data is automatically collected. That comes for free with the management system. So you get this detailed process data. And we can ask questions, for example, of does it matter whether the predictions were initially wrong or right? Do you learn more depending on that? Does the quality of the explanation that the student's providing make a difference with respect to the outcome? Um, those questions are now available. Though the data to address those questions are now available to us. Um, so that's the doer effect and closing the loop. Um, the call to the community here is um, um, we'd like to hear from you about do you think you have data that might be relevant uh, um, to these kinds of analyses or maybe nearly relevant? Because certainly part of what we'd like to hear about is, like, I think I do, but I'm not sure. Would my data work if it had this format? Um, uh, there are also in LearnSphere an increasing number of, of related kinds of analytic routines, and you'll hear about one of those, uh, uh, the rise of approach that's been implemented in LearnSphere, but it was actually developed by, our, uh, by the community, by colleagues at uh, Lumen Learning. Uh, and then uh, the other question relates to new ways to support uh, active learning, and, and it'd be great to have a conversation uh, about your ideas about how to do that, whether this predict, explain, observe, explain might work for you, how you could implement it, that sort of thing. Um, so I'll come back to those questions to you in a moment, but just to summarize, uh, this cycle is about not just applying learning science, but doing it and making it possible for all of us to engage in doing. And you know, especially uh, for some of us who you know, are scientists, maybe in other domains, uh, engaging in a little iteration based on data ought to be reasonably straightforward. Um, Open Simon makes it feasible, a number of tools for that. And, and I think you've started to see some uh, indications that we could really have a dramatic impact on student learning, that we could maybe go from these two times better to maybe 10 times better with these kinds of tools. So that, that's my aspirational call. Can we make that possible to, to get? We kind of have the Model T Ford version of educational technology now. Can we get to the jet airplane version? Uh, so I'm done, but now I want to ask you. Uh, first, do you have a data set uh, that has differences in student res learning resource use and some measure of student learning outcome that you could bring to bear here? How, anybody got a show of, yes, way over there. Yes. We'll get in touch with you after. Sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, in fact, uh, our uh, colleagues of ours, the question was, um, will this work with MOOC data, basically? Right. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, part of the LearnSphere team, um, there's four primary universities that were funded by that uh, grant, and it includes MIT and Stanford and the University of Memphis. And uh, our colleagues at MIT, actually did a doer effect analysis of um, two of their, uh, I think they were computer science courses. Uh, and you know the, the formative assessment activities are somewhat different, but in fact, they, they also found a doer effect in their, their data. Um, uh, that, the one I showed was a Coursera MOOC on the outside, but the the reading materials and the formative assessments were all live, so that, that was already some, some MOOC data. And then you have out, outcome data. Yeah. Another form of outcome data and, and another way we explored this causal inference is uh, quizzes after each unit. So this psych course had 11 units. And so we could ask, does individual student variation in resource use across the units lead to a doer effect. So if a student does more in unit three, but less in unit four, do they do better in unit three than they do in unit four? Um, and, and indeed, that's what we found. Um, 
we actually did how much doing you did done in uh, units before, during, and after. Um, and it turns out all of those have a positive coefficient. The during is the uh, biggest, before is next, and there is an after, which is a little bit, which raises the issue that there's probably some third variable uh, action in this doer effect uh, association. Yeah, Michael. Ken, um, would a, say, a large face-to-face um, -face class that's using uh, digital courseware or maybe multiple sections of a class that's using digital courseware qualify for what you're looking for? Yeah. Um, uh, in fact, we've been uh, thinking about ways that even gradebook data, you know, student by assessments could be used to do something like this. So which of your many activities in your gradebook is the most associated with your final exam outcomes? And if it is highly associated, right, to get a good correlation, you have to have variation. To have variation means there are some students on that assignment who are doing poorly on it and on your final exam. So most You want to do something about them, right? Uh, so most of the institutions in this room should have data that that fits this description. Yeah, right. Um, and uh, uh, we're happy to help. In addition to the Learn Lab Summer School at the end of July, um, uh, the team, uh, Cindy's back there, can uh, can help. There's there's a uh, um, is it Learn Sphere dash help? Is that the the help email? Yeah. There's also a data shop dash help, and Cindy and team are very fast to uh, to answer your help requests in that regard, um, and even even phone calls sometimes. There are people listening online. If you can, yeah. The easier URL is learnsphere.org, and there's a contact us link on there. Uh, so. You can use LearnSphere and Tetrad in various ways to discover what's effective. Uh, would you like to make reading more active? Oh, yeah, David. Yeah, just I, I'm glad you mentioned Tetrad here. So we have tons of data that's exactly like this and are interested and new and have read a couple of books on causal inference. But are there opportunities to collaborate on the research side, like how to use Tetrad to ask these questions? How yeah, to actually what, what happens there? at the summer school is we... We take applicants and we ask for applications because then we do a, we do a pairing process. We try to find t two uh, of the applicants who can work together productively, like a, very, a prototypical one for the educational data mining track is somebody's coming with data and a question. Somebody's coming, somebody else is coming with analytic skills and, and, and looking for data. Uh, and then you get two mentors each each team has two mentors over the week, um, including me or John Stamper, for example. And then, you know, you're working on that project starting on Monday, and by Friday, do a poster presentation of that. And, um, yeah, many of those projects have led to insights. Sometimes they're published. Sometimes they're turned around into course improvements. So, indeed, you know, and that you get... Uh, 40 hours of attention, basically, <laughs> over the week. Oh, yeah, for Tetrad support, um, you, if you go to the Tetrad website, you know, just like I was saying with Cindy, they, they have web access. And, um, and, and uh, for a nominal fee, you can take Richard's course. <laughs> you can also email him direct. Uh, so any other thoughts about uh, uh, m making reading more active uh, and or questions? How are we doing time-wise? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, first of all, we do have some great data in intro bio that I'd love to talk to you more about. But secondly, Brandon and I were just conversing. How do we make this work be more formative in nature? So as the course is progressing, it's improving. 
Oh, rather, during the course. Rather than right. waiting till the end and getting a summative kind yeah. of answer. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, well, if, like I said, with this psych course, it has unit tests. And actually, with my own e-learning course, each, each of the 20 units in my course has a, a pool of items for a quiz associated with each unit. In my face-to-face -face version, I do flipped homework. So you, you, you do the reading and watch the lecture and do the quiz as many times as you want before class. And then I look at the dashboard before class and say, you know, I, I don't lecture anymore. Just, what do you got? What did you have trouble with? What do you want to know? Um, and, and I try to do the similar thing uh, um, with, with the uh, online course. So um, actually doing office hours in a chat, I don't know if anybody's tried that before, but it's pretty cool actually because instead of people waiting in line to talk to you, or, or instead of nobody showing up, somehow it's easier. <laughs> uh, to be in this chat space and, and students can be asking questions in parallel and you can kind of pull up and they hear other people, they see other people's questions, have a little more time to process it. Um, I feel like I drifted from the main point of your question, but oh, it was about iteration, right? So if you have these unit level quizzes, it, it is feasible. We don't have a learn sphere workflow exactly for this, but I, I could imagine probably with the components we have, setting one up so that immediately following each of those unit quizzes, you could do process to, to outcome, where the quiz is the outcome and the process is, well, what, what resources did they use before that unit and how well did they do on the quiz? Actually, one thing I do do in my course is I have a pool of items before the midterm exam that they can use to practice as, as often as they want before the exam. And I often show them, last semester, here was our doer effect. Those who reviewed, did more questions than the reviewed, do better on the exam. So do more review questions. I, that's more of a, a kind of metacognitive prompt to students from the data. But I, but I think these course, it would be great. I mean, you have to be trying something in one unit that would transfer to the other. So context-specific changes would have to wait to the next iteration to the course, but more generic things like a predict, explain, observe, explain in unit one. If it works, you might try it in unit four. <laughs> yeah. Michael. Um, this is a great example of a, an innovation that somebody in the group might um, develop that others might be interested in. Could you talk a little bit, Ken, about um, the ability to share these innovations within LearnSphere? Oh yeah, that that's great. Uh, certainly, all the any analytic workflow that you can create, um, and this is true if you you submit data, you get to decide the access privileges. So you can make your workflow completely public. You can keep it private. Similarly, with your data, um, actually, there's multiple layers with the data. One thing we've seen is some organizations don't want to move their data to our server. So even though it can be private on our server. The other thing you can do, and you don't need the source code to do this, you can have your own instance of, uh, of LearnSphere and DataShop at your location. So we have DataShop, I think, at, is it six other locations, or six total locations now, Cindy? Something like that. So if, if all the capabilities are at your location, then you, know, you can store the data on your server, but you still have all the capabilities to process the data. You can put it on ours. We can keep it private. Another layer is it's shareable but private, which means there's a request access button on either your workflow or your data. And then when a, somebody else clicks that, they basically get an email to you that will say, you know, they can type whatever. Can I see your data or can I make use of your So you can monitor who's using your stuff if you want. And all of those are, are options. With respect to sharing in a new techniques, uh, yeah, so uh, one thing that's new in LearnSphere is we have, you can re remotely access the input and the output end of a, of a workflow. So for example, if you want to try Bayesian knowledge tracing to do adapt adaptation in your system, you can make a Bayesian knowledge tracing workflow. Sorry for the jargon, maybe some of you know, but it's an adaptive algorithm. Um, you can run it first on data to set the parameters for that algorithm, but then you could 
send your uh, caliper coded interaction data to the workflow. The workflow would then come back with what's the update on skills and, and you could and your system could make problem selections based on that. So yeah, we're, we're envisioning it more generally is that it's not just about data analytics offline, but it could be live uh, adaptive learning algorithms that you can plug in and then sh again, share with others. Uh, we do have a Learn Lab corporate partners meeting, so that's another place where sharing occurs. Actually, our next one is next Wednesday. So stuff's happening quick. Any other questions? <laughs>